Assalamu alaikum. Today our topic is going to be about the head injuries during birth. Uh, this presentation is presented by Amal of Madison on the 12th of January of the year 2014. So before starting to discuss the head injuries during birth, we're going to have a quick, quick review regarding the anatomy of the scalp. The five layers of the scalp could be easily remembered as scalp. S stands for the skin, then comes the connective tissue, then comes the aponeurosis, then the loose areolar tissue, and then the pericranium. Keep in mind that the first three layers are going to be acting as a single unit and that they're going to be moving over the fourth layer, which is the loose areolar tissue. Also, keep in mind that the pericranium is usually adherent to the skull. Okay, what are the predisposing factors to head injuries during birth or head trauma during birth? Now, the predisposing factors that I'm mentioning here are most probably broad, but you can actually relate them to head injuries. They're broad because they could be the reason of not only head injuries, they could be the reason of different types of trauma during birth. Some of the predisposing factors are the cephalopelvic disproportion, small maternal stature, which could be a reason to some pelvic anomalies or some problems in the pelvis, prolonged or rapid labor, oligohydraminose, and remember oligohydraminose is the decreased amount of amniotic fluid around the baby, abnormal presentation, for example, in infants that are going to be in breech or face presentation, the use of the forceps in the vacuum, extraction, because they could produce some kind of pressure over the infant's head, extreme prematurity, large fetal head, and fetal anomalies. Regarding the head trauma during birth, they are subcategorized into two categories. They could be either hemorrhages or they could be fractures. If they were fractures, they would be of two kinds. They would be linear fractures and depressed fractures. Now, fractures are somehow related to hemorrhages. That's why I'm going to be discussing what kind of fractures are going to be more common in specific type of hemorrhages as we proceed in this presentation. Hemorrhages, on the other hand, could be divided into two subcategories. They could be either extracranial hemorrhages or intracranial hemorrhages. If we're talking about extracranial hemorrhages, we're going to be having three types, caput succedaneum, cephalohematoma, or subgallial hemorrhage. If it was intracranial hemorrhage, it would be epidural, subdural, and subarachnoid. So in this presentation, I'm going to be highlighting more on the type of hemorrhages that could occur during um, childbirth. We're going to start with cephalohematoma. Now cephalohematoma is a condition where we're going to have some kind of bleeding between the skull and the periosteum. Now because the bleeding is going to be between the skull and the periosteum, it's going to be most probably called subperiosteal bleeding because it's going to occur above the periosteum. So it's always limited to the shape of the cranial bone, as you can see in the image illustrated above. It's going to be confined to the shape of the cranial bone. Remember that it's not going to be crossing any kind of suture. Also remember that there is no kind of discoloration or ecchymosis or patache on the overlying scalp. As you can see in the image of this uh, beautiful infant, the skin color seems to be normal. Now, the cephalohematoma is not going to be obvious directly after birth. It usually happens after several hours to days after birth because the subperiosteal bleeding is a very slow process. Usually, cephalohematoma is accompanied with some kind of skull fracture, but what kind of skull fracture? We mentioned that we have two kinds. They're either linear or depressed. Now, in cephalohematoma, it's more probably associated with linear um, skull fractures and not depressed skull fractures. Cephalohematoma is because of the rupture of the blood vessels traversing the skull to the periosteum. It's often a fluctuant swelling. What do I mean by fluctuant? I mean that it's going to be a movable swelling. And usually it's unilateral as the image illustrated above, yet sometimes it could be bilateral. Now, this is an x-ray of an infant that has cephalohematoma. You could see that the cephalohematoma takes the shape of the underlying bone, and you could see the soft tissue mass, uh, the soft tissue edema or mass or accumulation of blood that you could see here. 
in the following image. The second type of the extracranial hemorrhage we're going to be talking about is called the caput succedaneum. Caput succedaneum is going to be because of bleeding below the skull and above the periosteum. Now, what causes caput succedaneum? Caput succedaneum is most probably because of the pressure which is applied to the scalp against the dilating cervix. Because it's the pressure which is applied to the scalp against the dilating cervix, it's going to be most probably caused or it could be more probably seen in vaginal delivery. So in caput succedaneum, you could see some subcutaneous fluid accumulation, poorly defined margins, and it's non-fluctuating, which means that you cannot move the mass of the caput succedaneum. One thing to keep in mind when it comes to caput succedaneum is that it's not going to take the shape of the underlying bone. That's why it could cross the suture lines. On the other hand, in caput succedaneum, you could see some skin discoloration, some patiki, some ecchymosis, which is not obvious in the cephalohematoma. Now, because it could be sometimes um, kind of confusing to differentiate between the caput succedaneum and cephalohematoma, I found this table online. It basically summarizes the main differences between these two types, and it's very easy to understand. So let's go through it. In caput succedaneum, we said it's going to be present on birth, at birth. In cephalohematoma, it needs a while to appear. And why is that? Because the subperiosteal bleeding is a very slow process. In cephalohematoma, it's going to take the shape of the bone and it's usually gradually developing. It has hard edges and does not cross the sutures. In caput succedaneum, it may lay on the suture and may cross them, but it does not have well-defined borders. Caput succedaneum is going to be a soft mass that pits on pressure. Cephalohematoma, it's not going to be pitting on pressure. Cephalohematoma, we have no skin changes. In caput succedaneum, we could have some skin discoloration such as ecchymosis or patiki. In caput succedaneum, the size is going to be largest at birth and then gradually subsides. In cephalohematoma, it's the opposite because it usually appears after birth and usually disappear within six to eight weeks to a few months after birth. In caput succedaneum, it's not associated with any kind of skull bone fracture, whereas in cephalohematoma, it's most probably accompanied with skull bone fracture. And as we already mentioned, what type of skull bone fracture is most commonly um, associated with cephalohematoma? It's going to be linear skull bone fracture. And in both cases, no treatment is going to be required. The third type of the of extracranial hemorrhage that we're going to be talking about is called the subgallial hematoma or the subgallial hemorrhage. Now, this type of hemorrhage is going to be in the potential space between the skull periosteum and the gala aponeurosis. Why does this kind of hemorrhage happen? Usually it happens because some kind of pressure is going to be applied to the infant's head at delivery. Most probably happens if the use of the vacuum extraction is present in this delivery procedure. And what happens in subgallial hematoma? There is a rupture of the emissary vein which leads to the accumulation of the blood under the aponeurosis. Subgallial hematoma usually is going to be more evident at the occiput. And you can see in these pictures, the hematoma or the swelling is going to be more evident at the occiput. You could see some skin discoloration. You could see in this image some kind of redness appear. It's very important to identify this kind of hemorrhage because the infant could go into hemorrhagic shock where the infant is going to have pallor, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, and hypotonia. And if the amount of fluid is really large enough, a fluid wave is going to be visible in the infant's head. In the case where an infant could have subglial hematoma, you might need to put him or her under phototherapy uh, because you might need to investigate hyperbilirubinemia. Okay? And um, the features of the subglial hematoma, you're going to be having diffuse swelling of the head. And the sutures are usually not palpable because the amount of fluid under the head is going to be too large that sometimes it could be more than the estimated. Within 48 hours, 
the blood tracks could go between the fibers of the occipital and the frontal muscles causing bruising behind the ears along the posterior hairline and around the eyes and here you could notice how the blood has accumulated around the ears so this has been the subglial hematoma now we're going to we finish the extracranial hemorrhage we're going to be talking about the intracranial hemorrhage we mentioned intracranial hemorrhage could be of three types it could be could be subdural subarachnoid or epidural epidural is most commonly accompanied with skull fracture leading to the rupture of the middle meningeal artery Subdural usually is going to be because of the damage of some superficial veins and the rupture. And subdural hemorrhage is usually a slower process of hemorrhage than the epidural. Subarachnoid is going to be because of the veil, vein of Galen is going to be damaged due to the tear in the dura at the junction between the phallic cerebella and the tentorium cerebella. How to identify intracranial hemorrhage and what's the clinical picture of an infant with intracranial hemorrhage? Altered consciousness. A breathing abnormality, so where the breathing, breathing could be either absent, irregular, or periodic, or gasping. Eye problems, the eye, you should notice that there is no movement in the eyes, or the pupils may be fixed and dilated, some vomiting, high-pitched cry, anterior fontanelle is tense and bulging. Lumper puncture reveals bloody CSF, which is most commonly related to the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Diseminished or absent maroon reflex, poor muscle tone. Now something to remember and something I need to mention regarding the anterior frontal is that the anterior frontal is going to be very important in diagnosing different kinds of um, problems in an infant. Always remember that you have to feel the anterior frontal in any infant. And keep in mind that the anterior frontal is supposed to be small at birth, yet it enlarges in the first two months. After that, it's going to be reducing in size till it closes at 18 months. Now, if there is a reduced closure of this anterior frontal, then this could be because the child might have rickets, hypothyroidism, or hydrocephalus. And when feeling the anterior frontal, if you felt that there is lots of tension of this anterior frontal, then this is going to indicate increased intracranial pressure. Whereas if you feel that it could be sunken very easily, then this could be a sign of dehydration. So practically, this is everything I have to present today. These are the references that I use for my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and found it beneficial enough. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful day. Again, if you had any kind of questions, feedbacks, corrections, comments, or anything you'd like to share with me, please don't hesitate to contact me at my email, amalofmadison at gmail.com. Again, have a wonderful day and salam alaikum.